I was telling Rick to turn on the recorder. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Um, has anybody on the call tried out this new um, transcript recording yet? Yeah, I did. It's not bad. As you can imagine, uh, you, you, the acronyms don't get translated well at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried it out too. It was pretty good. Um, I, I, I know Rick. I know you know I tried it out, but uh, yeah. from you know the aspect of catching what everybody said and kind of you know being able to follow the conversation, uh, it was it was a pretty good job. I know the one yeah, we I use agree. in my company. The one we use at my company is is not as good as that one. Wow, that's interesting. That's, that's that is interesting. Well, we have an Avaya voicemail, an Avaya switch, you know, telephone switch, and we use Microsoft uh -huh. Outlook for the transition from the telephone voicemail to the email, and that tra that is horrible. You you never get a good translation. Sometimes it's even funny to read because it doesn't say what people said. <laughs> <laughs> And, and sometimes the the the, um, the the transcripts are Freudian, are very Freudian, right? Yeah, yeah they could be. <laughs> we can claim that that it was a Freudian slip on the on the transcript translation. I see, I see. All right, I'm going. I'm going to. We'll, we'll get started, um, and then anyone else that that happens to come in. Um, if we get any new people in, then we'll just have to slip them in somehow. Let me make sure. All right, I'm going to read out. I think I've got everybody. I'm going to read out who I see on the call. And if I missed anybody, please let me know. So I see um, Larry Burke, Dennis, Eric Bookbinder, Jeff Marchi, Rich Jackson. Gary Gumville, George Xavier, Brian Heisey, Bill Franklin, John Appler, Sylvester Mann, um, Gary Gumville, and Sierra, Paul Frieda, and Larry Fish. Did I miss anybody? You missed me. Oh, a Jake. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you're always at the top of the list. <laughs> I'm going to take I'm going to take my marbles and go home. Okay, okay, that'll that'll teach you to get on late, won't it? Eh? That's what um, I get. Yeah. All right. So I'm glad. So let me run down the list and see who would like some time tonight. And um, there's nobody new, so um, we should have enough time to get through everybody. Um, Let's see, because of course I always say that, and then um, we get squished towards the back end. Um, okay, Bear, would you like any time? Uh, yes, yeah, brief. But yeah. Okay, um, Dennis, it was lovely seeing you earlier on. A real pleasure. I'm so glad that even if it was only short. I'm glad that we connected, Dennis. Dennis. Dennis was finishing a round of golf with his buddies in which his team came first. So I, think, I think we owe him a round of applause for that. <laughs> and number one is always good. And, um, yeah, I want, I want enough to pay for my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and since the golf yeah. club is all of five minutes on my bicycle from here, I decided to stop by when he was having his lunch. So, um, Dennis, would you like any time tonight? Yes, I would, Rick. Okay. Um, Eric, hello. Would you like some time tonight? Yeah, um, a few minutes. Okay. Uh, Jeff Marchi, would you like some time tonight? Yeah, you know, I have a short comment on fixes for hot flashes that don't require medicine. Okay. Excellent, we like that. Um, Rich Jackson, would you like some time tonight? Actually, I think I'll just take notes and listen this evening. Okay. Um, 
Gary, would you like some time? No, I actually want to just relax and listen. <laughs> okay. Is is does that have anything to do with the fact that you might be moderating the inner conversation call on um on Wednesday? Yes, I'm totally stressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like since we're right at the beginning, we push it off to the end. Would you like to give everybody just a little uh, 30 second um, promotion for your call on, on Wednesday? Sure, I can. Right now, go for it. Oh, right now. <laughs> yeah, oh. right now. Oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, yes. Well, of course, we are here to listen to or to have everybody just talk about um, whatever they're going through with this with this illness, this this cancer that we're carrying, and on Wednesdays everybody is welcome to do that. I mean, no matter where you're at, whether you're at the beginning stages, end stages, middle stages, we're all dealing with whatever it is, uh, frustrations and fears and you know, whatever we're dealing with, uh, it's kind of fun to be able to talk about that with a group of people that's safe um, instead of your family and relatives, you know, so <laughs> kind of nice. So that's that's what we do. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that, that, as, as most of some of you know, because um, some of you are regulars on that call, it's not a technical call. They try to stay away from the technical questions that we answer here, and they delve into the, um, I hate to use the word, but it, it, it is appropriate, the emotional side, and it's a men only call, and um, usually there are a bunch of laughs, and it can get serious too. And there are now uh, four moderators on that call, three of whom are, on, are with us today um gary jake and rich jackson and uh, the fourth is john tysberg and they rotate so um that's that call it's at eight o'clock um eastern five o'clock pacific uh every wednesday and uh same rules as here free drop in and you're all very welcome it's it's a good conversation uh, George, it would be a very good conversation for you to participate in, I think. Just yeah. saying. Just yeah. saying. What are, try, what are you trying to say, Rick? <laughs> just saying. Just saying. Emotional okay. Stability. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And since you're the next person on my list, is there anything you'd like to talk about tonight? Uh, I have a, I have a, just a frustration and a clinical question. Sure. And how about Brian Heisey? Anything you'd like to talk about? Uh, nothing tonight, thank you. Okay, but it's good to hear your voice and I'm glad you're on the call, Mr. Heisey. I bet it's hot and humid in, in Chicago, isn't it? What's that? I bet it's hot and humid in Chicago. Actually, it just started pouring and the temperature is dropping, so. Oh, okay. Okay, that's what, <laughs> getting some relief. That's what that's what Bear's hoping for in North Carolina, I think. Absolutely. Um, Bill Franklin, anything for you tonight? Uh, yes, I do have something. So many Good. people have so many people have said yes. I was I was surprised. I was about to say I could wait, but <laughs> if we no, get time, yeah, we, I I think we'll have time to get through everybody as as long as we don't get anybody brand new on the call. Um, we're going to have time. John Appler, anything for you? I'm good, Rick. Thanks very much. Sure. Sylvester, how about you? No, thanks very much. Okay. Um, Len, how about you? Niente. Niente. Okay. Um, Paul Frieda, anything for you tonight? Nothing for me tonight, thanks. Okay. Larry Fish. Anything you'd like to discuss? Nothing for me tonight, thank you. Oh, good. See, this, this bottom half, everybody's silent. And um, Jake, anything you'd like to talk about? 
Um, no. If, if we had time, and maybe I could get some opinions on mattresses for people with cup, prostate cancer and back pain. Okay. If we have time. No, I mean I, I think that's 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 a great something we never talk about, and it's a great point, and and we'll make time. Okay. Okay. So let's kick off with um with Bear. You're up. Uh, <clears throat> uh, went on a Colorado trip. Uh, I had a great time, but it was exhausting. Uh, I had a trip planned to Iceland. It was supposed to be four weeks. 1,500 miles of driving, uh, kind of not substandard, but just adequate accommodations. And I had to cancel that trip. It was just too uh, arduous. Uh, that's all background stuff. As of today, which is a milestone, I have no longer cathing. Uh, I probably started cathing in February, four times a day. Uh, that went on for almost three months, then went down to two. Now, one and I went to my urologist and I am not I do not have to cath anymore so that is a big uh, relief. Uh, testosterone is up slightly from last month. It was um, what thirty nanograms I guess, and now it's forty one. But my PSA was down from uh, 0.5 last month to this month to 0.02, uh, which I you know I guess is good. Um, I have uh, tests next week, a whole body bone scan and CT chest with contrast, uh, nervous because I have stage four, so I have METS, and this is the first comparison to the initial one that was done in uh, February when I was uh, first diagnosed, so I'm a little nervous about that. That's going to be uh, next uh, Tuesday. Uh, and uh, lastly, and I don't know if this is the right place, Rick, you're going to have to, you know, let me know. Um, been on ADT, Lupron, Zytiga, Prednisone, Fosamax, Dutesteride, I don't know, a whole bunch of stuff is most of you guys are familiar with. Um, the uh, ADT Lupron therapy, of course, has uh, stilled any libido and, uh, you know, end result of uh, ED. And I'm curious how other guys have handled this, uh, if they've had any success with any particular therapies. And of course, the most difficult is uh, to me that the uh, libido is, is, uh, is gone. So I don't know if this is a proper place to, uh, to get, you know, feedback or information. That's it. So um, the answer is yes. It is a very good place. Usually that's a topic that gets unpacked um, on a pretty regular basis on Peter's core, um, the low and intermediate. It doesn't necessarily belong there, but it gets, it gets raised a lot more often. Um, I, we don't have Peter on the line. We do have um, Gary on the line who, um, uh, has often participated in that discussion. So I, I, we can certainly um, spend a little bit of time, and I think it's not a bad thing to do on this call, on, on with this advanced call, because it tends to get swept under the, um, the carpet of advanced disease, um, because there are so many other things going on. Um, let me just ask you a couple of, of questions, because I, I made some notes. Um, you say that your PSA is down to 0 0.02. Is 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 that right? That is correct, Rick. Yes. Great. And and what was it a month ago? 0 0.05 uh, nanograms. Okay. So. Um, and um, and your testosterone is down to 30 from 41. Did you say? I'm sorry. It's the other way around. It's 41 now. It was. 30 nanograms last month. Okay, so it's up. So it, it's up, up to 41 from 30. Okay. Um, you know, the, the issue with that is the testosterone is all over the place. Um, and, um, but at the same time, 
it's better the closer it is to less than 20. So if it were me and it's hang in at that level, um, I might be wanting to talk about possibly using a different um, LHRH drug. What, what, what are you on? Is it Lupron you're on right now? Yes, Rick, that's correct. Yes. Um, and I have monthly shots. And you have monthly shots. I was going to yes. ask you. Okay. So the monthly shots should not really make a big difference. But the one thing about having monthly shots is that you could just as easily get um, um, I'm drawing a uh, I'm drawing about the Garalix. The Garalix. Um, yeah, Firmagon. And um, and that is probably of all the LHRH drugs, it's the most effective. So you may be wanting to discuss with your docs whether they if, if, if it doesn't come down um, to those levels closer to 20, um, whether they would give you the garlics. Ken Anderson isn't on the call. This is a this is a um, issue for Ken Anderson that he um, it's one of his pet issues and he's knowledgeable about it. Um, I did. There, I, I did speak to my oncologist. He said, uh, just going for two months is not enough of an indication yet. He said that uh, we need to, you know, if it continues to rise uh, by next month, following month, maybe we need to have a discussion. But he doesn't want to get with the fact is it's some some slight rise. And then all of a sudden there's a, you know, a, the, what he calls a panic button push. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, but uh, but but. It, but but I think what's important is that you is that you that you have your eye on it and yes. and and that that that's really that is really really important. Um, let me um, let, let's go back to your issue. Um, let's go back to this ED issue. Uh, and I just have one small thing to say about it. And then I'll bring some other guys in who I'm sure have dealt with the dealt with the problem. The LHRH drugs that take away your testosterone um, remove your libido. Yes. Now, for some men, they remove it totally. For other men, um, they do not. There are probably about 10% of men that aren't affected at all. And there are a fair number of men who have still have a libido. It's just not a, as great. The problem with no libido is that you don't have the desire. But in theory, you still have the capacity and you know the muscles are still there. And if you haven't had, as you haven't, um, I believe that's right. You, you haven't had primary treatment. No, did you have primary treatment? I can't remember. I'm sorry. Meaning what? Did primary. you have radiation or or surgery? Chemo? No, no. Mm -mm. no. So if Strictly you haven't drug. Had, right. So if you haven't had radiation or surgery, then your your nerves are intact. So the issue then becomes um, that. You, you, you have to work to, um, to retain the musculature. So what I'd like to do is just open this conversation up. And, you know, it's, we'll, we'll spend, let's spend at least 10 minutes talking about this because I think there's probably, there's gonna be a lot of people that have something to say. And Gary, do, do, do you wanna kick this off? Because I know it's a pet subject of yours too. Well, yeah, erectile dysfunction. I I do struggle with it too because I um I'm not on ADT, but I am on uh, Lexapro, and that does kind of something really similar. It really uh, reduces the desire for sex. I just it's weird, and and it's so when I do 
what I call penile rehab, it does take quite a bit longer for me. Um, you know, and I, I just have to, I have to grin and bear it, you know, I just got to do it and it, it, but it takes longer. So I don't know what else to say about that. I just, it, it's, it's not as easy. It, it does take work. I have to ask not, well, with specifics. I mean, we're all obviously adults. When you say penal rehab, speaking exactly of what? Well, I will take my, um, low dose of either the, the Cialis tablet or the Viagra tablet. So the low dose of that. And then I will use something that I can look at and then I will do self-stimulation. And um, if I'm not on Lexapro, I can pretty much have an orgasm pretty fast. But boy, on the Lexapro, it's, it might take me 40 minutes. So it's, it's hard work. Um, but you know, in the end, I, I was able to bring blood flow and get everything working. So I don't know what to say about that. That's what it takes for me. Gary, what is, what, this is Jake. What is, what is Lexapro? Lexapro is an antidepressant. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, who else would like to address this issue? Um, this is George. Um, I can, I can, uh, I can say a little something about it. I've been dealing with it for four years now. Um, I've tried the shots, the the pump, the vacuum pump. Um, uh, different medications. Um, the uh, Lexapro, that's a very common side effect uh, of Lexapro and those drugs where you can get an erection, but you can't have an ejaculation and it takes forever. That's very common, actually. Um, if you're, there's other drugs for depression that don't do that. Uh, one is bupropion, which is like Wellbutrin that doesn't uh, affect sexual activity as much. So if you're, if you're doing it for depression, you might consider a different medication, um, see if that works. But it's, 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 it's just, it's tough. It's tough. I haven't really been able to have an erection in a few years. So it, um, and I've tried Cialis, I've tried Viagra. One of the urologists I was seeing recommended surgery and I wanted to hold off on that, but that that uh, kind of is the last approach if you can't get it. But if you go see a good urologist that deals with that, I think um, there's a lot of options out there. Um, George, uh, Slint, did you say injections like Trimix uh, did yes. not work for you? Yeah, I yeah. Oh. And it hurt like hell. It, it, it wasn't fun. <laughs> no, true. It, it, I, got, I got an erection, but it didn't last long. And I tried, I tried different doses and, you know, different, you know, different ways of injecting and uh, it just didn't work. I mean, uh, you know, staying hard is for me is difficult. You know, I can actually have an ejaculation at this point because I don't be <laughs> for for two years, but it is very weak, and it, uh, it, it, I do have, I do have the, uh, the thoughts. I mean, I look, I look at women now, and I, I actually think of like, wow, I would like to have sex with her, but that wasn't happening for the whole time I was in ADT. I had no desire. Yes. Uh, could have, she could have, she, I mean, they could have given me a lap dance. I wouldn't, nothing would have happened. So, um. It's coming back very slowly, but. So, so I take it you're off ADT therapy now. Yeah. yeah, I've been off ADT for about two years, and I was on it for two years. But I'm also on a, I'm a, I'm on, I'm on Avidart, um, which uh, affects testosterone, and my, my testosterone level is normal. So theoretically, I, I should be able to, but um, I also was using a lot of opiates, too. 
and that 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 really um, takes the drive away. So uh, it's it complicated. Yeah. Yes, it seems what was once pleasure has now become kind of a job. Yeah. What I've heard from uh, Dr. John Mulhall at MSK, who's a specialist in this area, is that after a number of years on ADT, there uh, you may know this better than me, George, being having a an MD, uh, there's a valve that once the penis fills with blood, the valve is closed so that the blood doesn't drain out. But that valve weakens after years of being on ADT so that a, an erection can't be maintained no matter what you do. Uh, have, do you, are you familiar at all with that? Well, uh, if, no, my, I mean, I'm an ER doc. So my, my, <laughs> what I see in the ER is guys that, uh, you know, take too much Cialis or too much Viagra. And I got to give them injections to 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 get their erection down. So, you know, the after four hour. Um, four hours, yes, yes. Um, which can be. I've dangerous. not heard of that with the valve, but it makes sense. I mean, I I I mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of guys that say years after they they're still having trouble. Yeah. Um, Len, I, by the way, I'm sorry you mentioned Moho. He has a, a very interesting, and I watched it, um, uh, video on YouTube. Uh, and he goes through it. And I mean, he's a guy that seems to to really know his stuff and went into it in, in great, great detail. And of course, he didn't say it specifically, but he referenced it. Anybody on AET over time uh, that uh, it's almost not recoverable at that time, you know, or after a year or more. And of course, he recommends what was said, exercise. But now, what, as I say, what seemed to be pleasure and, and uh, you know, natural seems to be more like a, a business deal or or uh, or work okay um we we um we actually just referred somebody to mal hall that may come on this call if not today um sometime soon and it, it, it's a guy who is frequently on peter's call um and uh so i would um uh yeah, I would encourage you also, Larry, if if you feel up to it, to attend Peter's call um, to discuss this issue. But the, the big difference, of course, with Peter's call is you're not going to get people that have been on lengthy ADT. So most of them are dealing with ED as a result of nerve damage, which is huh. a different situation to what you're dealing with, which is why also um, we, we know... Um, you know, I think it's worthwhile talking about this here. Who, who else would like to contribute something? Maybe about the trimix or somebody who has been on ADT and hasn't had um, any initial treatment, um, surgery or radiation. Or, um, <clears throat> and anyone else want to contribute? Yeah, Rick, this is Josh. Oh, uh, sorry. John Appler here, Rick. Hold on, John, hold on a second. I promised Larry okay. to I would go to him next. I'm so sorry. Larry, and then you, John. Larry, you're up. Which Larry? Larry Fish? Larry Fish. Oh, yeah, good. So so what I've noticed, unfortunately, over like the last three plus years on Lupron is that my penis has shrunk like to maybe an inch or it seems like I have to pull it out, fish it out from the tissue. And very rarely I might get turned on by some dream or seeing somebody. And then if I can do something with it, I do it. I mean, I stimulate myself, but it doesn't last very long. And I'm wondering what you were saying about retaining uh, the musculature. Is that something I should, like, exercise or work on more? A way to hold on to it? Or your That's what is going? Moho says that. He says that if you don't use it you lose it yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. right yeah, unfortunately larry there's no coming back from that once the once there's atrophy of the penile tissues uh they can't be rehabilitated yeah that's what i was thinking but if people were saying like retain or keep up the musculature 
but it just seems to have slipped away year by year more and more. Yeah, are, you, are you taking low dose uh, Viagra or Cialis? No, I never did. Oh, well, that's why. <clears throat> so, well, I missed an opportunity, probably. Yeah. You know, this is this is this is Jake. You know, I've I've found the same problem, it's a very similar problem to what Larry's talking about. But um, having been on Lupron so long, I don't. You know, I used to try the pump. Uh, I used to try to take Cialis to keep the blood flowing. But because my libido is so low, I don't even care anymore. I don't even try. Uh -huh. You know, I, I'm maybe eventually I'll regret it, but I don't know. You're alive, right? I'm alive, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but the the motivation is just is just not there. Not there. Yep. Um, John Atkins. John. Yeah, Rick. Uh, I just wanted to offer up. There's another, I think, a real professional in the field. If you're anywhere near the San Francisco Bay Area, and that would be Dr. Thomas Lou L U E. Right. And this is all he does. And uh, he was very helpful to me uh, with low dosage of uh, Salus and other things. So uh, I would recommend him, him as a resource. Yep, thank you. Yeah, and his, and his, um, his nurse practitioner, uh, Nanette Perez, is also excellent. Um, and, you know, they're sort of the equivalent of uh, John Mulhall on the, on the West Coast. Um, both those guys are... are, are are really really good um if you're on if you're on either coast um, uh, Rick, let me let me ask a quick question a bit related to this uh side effects of viag Vi viagra for me were intense headache and congestion um mm -hmm. the question is have other guys experienced that and over time does that lessen meaning does it uh, become less uh, disturbing it never did for me. Meaning it never did. You never had those side effects or it never. No, no, no I had those side effects and they never lessened. OK. Yeah. All right. My, this is George. Me too. I mean, I, I had to take a very low dose of Viagra because I would get extremely flush and uh, very uncomfortable. So. OK. Enough said. I, Thank you. Back, back, in, the, back, in, the, back in the days. When, what, back. I'm sorry, Len. Go ahead, Jake. I'm just going to say, back in the days when I was actually trying, mm -hmm. I had I had issues with Viagra too. I didn't like it, um, but Cialis worked just as well without quite as many side effects for me. I didn't have the flushing or the headaches. Some people apparently get like a a, a red um, mm -hmm. cast over their eyes, or they they think they have a, a red cast over their eyes. They just you know when they're taking Viagra. Mm -hmm. So I did not get that with Cialis. So okay, maybe, that's maybe. that's good information. Otherwise, I should try something else and not yeah. just let me, you know, quit. All right, good. Right. Thank you. And, and Bill Franklin wanted to get in, and then Len. Bill. Yeah, I was going to say I'm I'm currently taking Viagra, and I do not have those symptoms. Um, so I had a radical prostatectomy, and I was on ADT for 22 months, mm -hmm. and uh, the entire time I was on ADT. Uh, almost the entire time. Uh, my doctor also specializes in erectile dysfunction. He's a urologist that does that also, right? So he recommended the pump while on ADT, whether or not you use it for sexual intercourse, use it to keep the penis exercised. Mm -hmm. And I did that. Now, after ADT uh, with Viagra and occasionally the pump, you know, I, you know, rehabilitation, whatever you want to call it, um, I'm getting there. So, and I almost, Gosh, I don't know. A month after off, my testosterone is still not very high. That's one of the things. That's the thing I'm going to ask about. But uh, um, uh, like almost a month after getting off of ADT, I, you know, I was having uh, semi erections in my, you know, dreaming, you know, nocturnal ones. So I'm dreaming, you know, I wake up with a semi erection. So uh, I'm younger than a lot of you. I, I understand that, uh, but not too young. I'm fifty, be fifty five in a couple months, but. Uh, it seemed that the path my doctor gave for me worked for me. So, and I, I did have a nerve sparing uh, prostatectomy, which worked. I can mm -hmm. orgasm. Of course, there's no ejaculation because I don't have prostate. Uh, but, and, and I don't know about the rest of you, and someone probably discussed this in the other meeting, but 
it's a completely different feeling <laughs> to, than it is when you have a prostate that's you know uh, accompanying you with ejaculation at the same time you're having an orgasm. It's it's different. That's all I can say. Still very pleasurable, but different. So is that what they call a retrograde ejaculation, where it ends up going back into oh, the no, bladder? No, no, no. No, I have nothing. I mean, if you don't have a prostate, yeah. you, you right. can't yeah, there's because, nothing there. Yes. Because, retrograde is what happens after a terp. Yeah. Right. That to me. After my terp, I would still have an orgasm, but it wouldn't come out. It would like go back inside. But it, it, it yeah. quite quite pleasurable, but different. Mm -hmm. Different. Yes. The nerves and and some of the muscles around where the prostate uh, was still react. That's the orgasm part, and it's. Huh. But there's no, there's none of that ejaculation. You know, the surging for a few times, and it's just like it suffuses out along different nerve endings. <laughs> it's, it was weird the first time I experienced, but uh, I've I've learned to enjoy it. <laughs> so. Um. I'll take it where I can get it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, is um, I, I, I do want to move on. Um, I don't want to move on, but we have to move on is probably what I should be saying. So excuse me. Um, and, and it is good that we've given this topic an airing. Uh, and please don't hesitate to raise it again um, on this call. Uh, like I say, it's discussed at length frequently um, on the um, on the low and intermediate call. And I will also say it is a topic that gets aired um, fairly frequently on the inner conversations call. Um, so again, raise, raise it on those calls, join those calls, raise it on those calls. But we have a slightly different situation um, here, not from inner conversation, but from low intermediate, as I say, because a lot of men here um, are also on ADT, and, and that exacerbates the, the, the whole situation. Yeah, but um, Rick, this is the bear. Thank you, because I did get some good information, like possibly trying uh, other medication other than Viagra, possibly Cialis or Levitra. So that's, good. that's good. you know, good. good insight. Thank you. Good. It's a pleasure. Um, OK. Um, Dennis Correa, you're up next. Okay. Uh, just before I get to my little problem, I give you know, uh, my side of this discussion too here was that at, at 70, uh, be 73 this year, uh, my libido and everything had already been going down when I got my diagnosis. So for me and my wife, you know, this was not particularly a uh, big deal to lose uh, my libido. Uh, an ability to get an erection, you know, had a lot of the similar uh, side effects of the penis, testicle shrinking up to next to nothing, uh, which just, you know, it's an inconvenience, <laughs> I guess you could say, but it's not, you know, from a, from a mental, psychological standpoint, it's not a major uh, issue for me or depression or anything like that. But that's that's my side for that. But the the thing I wanted to raise a question about is another touchy little situation where I've, in the past few weeks I've found myself to have a bowel incontinence mm. uh, after exercising, uh, especially squatting, bending stuff. Uh, I never I don't even feel it. I don't know it, it's happened. The only reason I I know it's happened is is uh, because of side effect again, because of everything has shrunk up so much. If I need to urinate, I don't ever, I can't use a urinal anymore. I have to sit down because there's nothing there. Uh, and when I do that and I drop my drawers, I oh, put that on my underwear. Yeah. There's a little spot about the size of a quarter or so. And I suspect this might be a side effect, uh, of both combination, maybe the chemo and the, um, the, the Lupron Zytiga type stuff where, you know, if, if all my muscles and my nerves have been impacted by this, uh, this, this little anal sphincter, I guess it would be, uh, is probably also been affected by it. So it's been a little more persistent. 
And I do have an appointment to see the doc that I usually use for my uh, colonoscopy, which I was due for this year, but with everything else going on, I said, gee, is this really worth uh, going through the aggravation of a colonoscopy again for, so I do have a consult with him tomorrow to talk about it, but just curious of any, I, I didn't see anything in the, in the literature relative to ADT or, or chemo uh, leaving you with this kind of a side effect. So I'll just open it up. Well, um, this one's near and dear to me because I've wrestled with minor fecal incontinence for years now. Um, because I got very large doses of, of, um, of radiation. I got about 42, 44 grays um, of pelvic girdle radiation and then about 50 odd grays or the equivalent thereof from the, um, from the seeds. And, um, and I had a weak bowel going in. Um, do, have you have you ever had any bowel issues before? Irritable? Never. I have very a very regular person every day, once a day, same time of day. Okay. Pretty much, unless I have a a real big change in my diet, eat too much Mexican food or something like right. that, I'll, right. you know, that could change it a little bit. But uh, generally, I, I don't get constipated. I generally don't have uh, diarrhea unless I get sick or something. But uh, so this is this is a new, a relatively new well, issue. So I mean, I think my issues are probably have a different source to yours. It, it, you know, it, mine are a radiation damage, which I'm happy to live with versus the alternative. And they're a little inconvenient at times. They they vary um, in terms of sometimes they're bad, sometimes they're not. There are times when I feel like I have tenesmus, which is kind of want, feeling the urge to uh, defecate, but, you, but there's nothing to defecate. Um, there are certain foods I know that I happen to like upset me more than other foods. So when I eat them, I know that I'm going to be wrestling with that for a while. Uh, definitely. Some of it is stress, incontinence, in other words, from, from sneezing, from um, uh, certain weight-resistant exercises that I might do, uh, something that is, is you know, truly stress. Um, you know, I'm riding along on my mountain bike and something happens and I fall off and, you know, so, but um, my feeling is that, I'm willing to deal with it and um, I take, you know, there are sometimes if I feel it's really bad, there are some precautions I can take, but it's not bad enough that it really changes my lifestyle. At the same time, like I say, um, it's not driven by chemo and I don't know to what extent it's driven by ADT. I will say this, because when I've discussed it with a couple of GI medonks in, in, in a couple of GI uh, doctors in the past, um, some of their advice has been to do Kegel exercises as regularly as you can, because they feel that the Kegel, that if you do do Kegels, uh, you can improve the musculature of the um, of the sphincter. And, and when I've been examined, they've said that the you know the, the musculature feels a little weak. So. Don't be surprised if one of the things your doc says to you tomorrow is to start is to go back on the old Kegel exercise. Well, of course, you never did them in the first place. Yeah, I never needed it before. That's but right. I, yeah, I've come up with that. I did a little, my own little research before I go to the doctor, and that's one of the things that I've got on my list to ask him about. Uh, the other thing is just increasing my my fiber intake with something like a methyl cellulose right. to help solidify the stools a little bit. And uh, I got to make sure I don't get too much caffeine. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know to what extent caffeine. And I mean, for me, it isn't even a function of 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 the of the um, 
solidity, I don't know, the, 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 the viscosity of what I'm excreting. It's just, it's more a muscle thing. You know, yeah, you know, I know in the, in the mornings after I have my breakfast and my coffee, that's my stimulation. Then I hit the bathroom and okay. well, have my daily know, bowel movement. And then, then, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't have that. A lot of it is just being aware and knowing what triggers you. But let, let me yeah. throw it open. Um, anybody else have, has anybody else had these issues? Certainly, um, particularly if it's been a result of ADT or chemo. Yeah, I'll well, speak up. Yeah. I'll speak up again, Rick. Um, Go ahead. Uh, like like you, I have the similar uh, problems with the rate from the radiation treatment, uh, the radiation proctitis, and some of the other symptoms that you described. Now, I'm not. I don't have any kind of uh, fecal incontinence. Except for I, what I did have was like very first, maybe the very first bowel movement in the morning. If if I didn't get to the toilet, I might not be able to stop it. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it never happened, you know, just as you describe or when I'm doing any kind of stress exercise or anything like that. Uh, so I actually went to physical therapy. You know, they taught me all kinds of stuff. And the thing I came away from that, uh, I did improve. And, uh, I use the uh, electrostimulation where they put the electrodes on you and it, you do the exercises at the same time that they're, you know, the, elect the electricity is running through your muscles and supposedly you get a greater, uh, mm -hmm. a greater, a greater tensing and a better exercise. So that might be something your doctor suggests, or you might ask for physical therapy for that. Um, my insurance covered it. It was no big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, when, the other thing I came away from that was uh, a product called Roll for Control. And it's just a, a small ball, a rubber, a plastic, I mean, a, a air inflated ball and a, uh, a band that you, you wrap the band around your legs and do the exercise. You put the ball between your knees and do the exercise. And uh, that was recommended by my physical therapist when I finished up. She said it's a product that you can do for maintenance. So, uh, mm. and I, I still have it. I still do it every day. So I do it about three, three four times a week. It's called Roll for Control. Roll for Control, and the uh, it's by a company called Phoenix Core Solutions. Uh, I'll put a I'll put a I'll put it in the chat window. Then. Okay, I was just about to do it, but if you will, that's even better. Thank you so much. So watch the but chat. He, are you online? Uh, Dennis is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Dennis is online. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so this is yeah, Gary. I, I I did a lot of kegels. And I still, every day, I do at least 50 kegels. And um, that's important. But exactly what Bill was saying, I, I've decided I've, I've been doing exercises. Every muscle that comes into my core, especially in my legs, um, and there's four muscles on each side of your legs. There's on the front side of your legs the sides, the internal part, and then on the back. And so those actually come right up into your core. And I've been trying to exercise those and it seems to actually really help. So, and you can do those without any real work. You just have to figure out where those muscles are and use some sort of a stretchy band or in my case, since I'm really, really cheap, um, <clears throat> I just went to um, uh, my little, uh, you know, my bands that I use over on my pickup, and I just kind of, you know, <laughs> use those. <laughs> and uh, but you can find each one of those muscles and they come right up there and you can actually really exercise them and it works. Hmm. I'll look into yeah. it. Yeah, the the roll roll for the uh, Phoenix Core Solutions website it describes, you know, those muscles are pronators or something different names like that, internal external. But they they're actually uh tied into the area around the uh the pelvic floor. So um, exactly. Those are the muscles. So, yeah, and you can learn how those can help you keep the, uh, you know, your sphincter muscle and your and your bladder 
uh, muscle tense or not tense, but you know, from leaking. And and I, mm. I just want to I want to add something here, which is that um, there is a subspecialty um, in physical therapy for the pelvic um, for the pelvic floor muscles. So um, you don't want to, ideally, you don't just want to see any physical therapist. Right, yeah. You Mine really was a specialist see, in that area, as Rick yeah, says. You want to see somebody who, who specializes in pelvic floor <laughs> physical therapy. And it turns out that the specialist was uh, a neighbor from down the street who oh. I just do in passing and saying hi, like walking around the neighborhood. And uh, so I go into this room and I lay down and this woman comes in to put electrodes on my pelvic floor and it's uh, my neighbor. So, <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh yeah, you, uh, yeah, pull down your shorts. Okay. Now this is, this is George. Uh, uh, look up something called puborectalis syndrome. Uh, there's a, the, a muscle that uh, starts on the inner aspect of the pubic bone and it wraps around the, the rectum. And sometimes that muscle gets, gets loose. And uh, sometimes they'll have to do surgery on it. They call it a rectal, uh, a, a puborectal sling, um, if it doesn't get better with the physical therapy. And sometimes um, a, uh, a thing called anal prolapse happens where when you're pushing down or urinating or doing any kind of Valsalva maneuver, you know, part of your rectum actually uh, evaginates out a little bit. And that causes a little bit of incontinence. Uh, so it happens while you're you're pushing out. So if you're sitting down urinating, that's you know that could be happening, and you know that's kind of a surgical problem. So I mean, uh, you know, if if um, you know if that doesn't work, the uh, physical therapy, there's some surgical things that can happen. George, mm. would, you, would you be kind enough just to put the name um, of that um, that muscle or that syndrome in the chat box window for us? Please? Sure. Thank you. What so do much. I do? Type a message? Yeah, it's does it does it should say chat somewhere and open that box and then um, just put it in the type it in the window there and make sure it gets sent to everyone. Okay, I see it. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, all right, well, I, um, Dennis, you've got a bunch of information there, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll be loaded uh, here when I go in to see the doc tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank yeah, you. We're going to keep moving, and I, I also want to, and I apologize for keeping you on hold so long, but we've got a couple of callers that we have not welcomed, and also Les. Shelter up is on, um, so I just want to touch base with them. Um, who is on the telephone right now that has not already introduced themselves? Anyone on the phone that hasn't introduced themselves and would like to introduce themselves? And um, well, I'll do a quick run through of who I see on the call as well. And. Um, and Les, welcome back. And did you need any time to talk to us today? I don't see you. You're, you're muted right now. You did so well last week, Les, getting that <laughs> microphone working, man. <laughs> I don't see. I don't see you uh, connected. But okay, no worries. I'll watch out and I'll see if I see it green, I'll come back to you. So let me just tell you who I see on the call, make sure I've got everybody. I've touched base with everybody. I see um, Bear, Dennis, Eric, Jeff Marchi, Rich Jackson, George Savier, Bill Franklin, um, Brian Heisey, John Appler, Sylvester Mann, Len Sierra, Paul Frieda, Larry Fish, Jake Hannum, and um, Les Shelder. Is there anybody that, oh, Spikangari, sorry, um, Rich Jackson. Is there anyone else that I have whose name I missed? 
Okay. All right. We'll keep going here. Um, Eric, are you with us? Are you with us, can Eric? Can you hear? We can I hear you. you. I thought about it for a while. Yes, we got you. Talk to us. Tell us how you are. What's going on? How's that back? Well, so I had my um, 29 staples removed yesterday. And actually, it was Friday. And uh, looks really good. It uh, looks like there might not even be much of a scar. Wow. Real smooth. Uh, probably more scars from the holes where they put the drains in than from the actual surgery. Um, I'm uh, trying to get up and around, and um, they want me to be walking on flat area. Well, Rick, you've been to my house. The only <laughs> flat area is inside the house. Oh, what about uh, up and down in front of the garage? That's flat. No, it's not, actually. It's, it's a fairly good slope okay. for the water. Okay. Okay. Um, do you remember the black anyway, guy that he had a couple of months ago when he fell in his driveway? Oh, yeah. Right. You're right. Yeah, and, I do. Well, and you can see right here, those of you that can see me, I fell again. Uh-oh. And that was, that was, I was on the way to get my staples out. I, um, I was dropped off it's in front of 400 Parnassus, the old UC hospital, UCSF hospitals, and, um, I just uh, I just collapsed. Um, so it's a problem I've been having more and more. Uh, I now am using a walker with a seat um, because I can walk 20 paces and then this weird thing hits me and I just collapse. So now I have a seat to, to sit in. I, I should have had that with me on, on Friday. Um, no one's been able to explain this phenomenon that I have. Um, it's it's similar to to the um, low blood blood pressure problem, right? You know, when you stand up fast, orthostatic hypotension it makes you pass out or at least feel woozy. Um, so I take some medication for that. So that doesn't in particular doesn't seem to happen, but this. Is, Looks like it's a similar thing, and, and if I do take my blood pressure, it is low. So, uh, another round of doctor's appointments. I'm going to the endocrinologist tomorrow. Um, so I have um, I have people looking into it, but no one has any answers. So, so um, I do actually have something to say on that whole issue because you've been on my mind. I almost sent you a note. Um, because you're not alone, um, Professor Bill has had some heart issues recently, AFib and br brachycardia, um, possibly as a result of going on a trial that uh, AZD6738, the ATR inhibitor, but possibly not because he noticed them even before he went on the trial. Now, um, I just read an article in Cure Magazine about a new specialty, and maybe you're already seeing this, this doctor, but there is now, it, it, it hasn't been ratified yet as a um, subspecialty, but there are a lot of doctors out there, not a lot, a number of doctors practicing it, and it's called um, Oncocardiology. Or maybe it's cardio oncology. Hold on a minute. Let me get the magazine. Don't go away, anybody. Let's all talk about him while he's not here. That's right. <laughs> what does okay. it mean, don't go away? I just got back. <laughs> so here it is. Here it is. It was sitting on my cistern. Um, and um, so, cardio oncology is the name of the um, is the name of the uh, specialty. Specialty. Um, 
there's a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering called Richard Steingart, who they quote. And there's another one at Dana Farber called Anju, A N J U, Noria, N O H R I A. Uh, they don't mention anybody from UCSF, I'm afraid, but you probably could um, make some inquiries. And my guess is there's going to be somebody. And they are specifically. Um, focused in on uh, cancer treatments that affect the cardio system. And they actually talk in here about AFib and brachycardia and certain, um, certain drugs that, that, that do affect um, the cardiac system. I think I seem to remember that somewhere in here they did mention docetaxel, taxotere. But anyway, um, I was ADT actually as well. At, well, ADT, yes, but ADT is a little different, Jake. So AD, ADT causes, um, um, what do they call it? Um, QRS syndrome? No. Something um, to do with, a, with one of the know, sine waves. The Q, QC time? No, it's much more simpler than that. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, I want to say metamorphosis. It's um, you know it, issues that arise from from cholesterol and sugar and um, those sorts of issues that give rise to 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 to, to cardiac issues. Metabolic syndrome. Metabolic. Thank you. Metabolic. Yeah. No, there's there's also just just today I saw an article that it, it, the ADT can increase the uh, QRS, uh, UT. make make it longer, and that's why a lot of some people on ADT have heart attacks, okay. especially when especially uh, when just QT. starting it. Prolonged uh, QT, prolonged QT interval. Is right. long QT okay? Yeah, and a lot of a lot of drugs do that, and the problem is, uh, it can cause. Uh, just sudden cardiac death. Right. Especially when you just start it. Yeah, well, if, with any drugs, even drugs that you've been on for a while, you know, if if the uh, the QT gets bigger and bigger, the risk gets you know higher and higher. And what happens is you just collapse, and that's that's the end of it. But what what does QT event. what does QT and QRT stand for? Well, the QT the QT interval is uh, you got the QRS uh, complex, and then you got the T wave. So they measure between the Q wave and the T the T wave the Q. So they call it the QT interval, and certain drugs uh, prolong that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the longer the longer the prolongation, the the higher the risk of sudden death. So um, you have, it's a calculation you have to do on an EKG. It's not something that, you know, it's based on your heart rate. And uh, so there's a calculation you have to do. It's called the corrected QTC interval. Mm -hmm. But a lot, a lot of drugs can do it. Um, but I guess the bottom line for all of this, Eric, is why don't you make inquiries to see if there is somebody that is uh, practicing this cardio oncology specialty at um at uc at ucsf yeah 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 maybe go online see and come back let us know and um and this article is in um cure magazine for uh, spring 2018. Um, so I think that's available online, Cure, Cure Magazine, spring 2018. And the article is titled Straight to the Heart. Straight to the Heart. And um, it's all about cardio oncology. I'm probably going to tear it out and, and, and save it. I was going to mention it. In one of my letters, I met still may Mike, 
but I'm putting out another link to it. So, you know, it's frustrating to people if I talk about something and they can't easily see it. Um, so, um, you know, I hopefully something, anybody else, I mean, I know we've talked about this several times and, and um, these issues around uh, this, this brachycardia and, 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 and Eric's loss of energy in this particular case. Anybody have anything else they would like to add about these, these, these possible heart issues that go along with, with, with uh, cancer treatments? So, um, Rick, there's a, actually a journal of cardio-oncology. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And there are some people at UCSF um, interested in the the uh, specialization. Okay. Well, one, who who is it that you said that you were seeing tomorrow, Eric? Oh, endocrinologist. An endocrinologist. Why don't you see if um. See if Agarwal can connect you to one of the cardio oncologists. Sure. And 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 let us know. And and I um, I've got to let um, I need to let uh, um, Professor Bill know about this fellow at Dana Farber because that's of course where where Bill's doing his clinical trial. So I'm leaving this open on my desk so I remember to send him a note afterwards. I also, um, Rick, I, Rick, I just posted the uh, Medscape article on that QTC interval prolongation that we were okay. talking about a minute ago. Thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a subset, I guess, of cardio, what what you call it, oncocardiology? Cardio-oncology. Cardio-oncology, okay. Cardio-oncology, okay. And I believe that's what uh, Steve was talking, George was talking about. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Eric, anything else that you'd like to raise? No, I think we're there. Are you driving or not? No, not yet. Okay. When did they say you can drive? They said I could drive when I feel okay driving. Okay, good. All right. That's that's great. You know, that they're giving you the green light when you, whenever you're comfortable. Right. Um, Okay. Do, you okay. Do you feel okay, Eric? I mean, you know, just are you just tired? Or? Well, I I feel I mean I have, I have a lot of pain from the from the surgery, right. but um, the you know the, this condition of of um, you know where where I where I have this it's kind of like passing out, but it's but not exactly, and so that makes me uncomfortable about driving. Right. If I'm driving and that happens, uh, you know, then it's all yeah. over. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eric, do you think that the surgery has resolved the the back pain? Can you distinguish between the back pain and the surgical pain in the back? Yes, it's it is quite different. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping that as the the um, as I heal from the surgery, that that pain will go away and the other won't be there. Um, but, you know, it, it's, I had an earlier surgeon, um, spine surgeon, talk to me about it. And he said that, you know, we go in there, we scrape them out, scrape all the cancer out that we can find, we build this whole structure, and six months later, it all comes back. So, that's what I'm looking at is, I got six months to get something else going. Listen, you'll take it whilst you can get it. And we're all That's fighting right. to find the next thing for you. Yep. You know that. So we're all rooting for you. That's for um, sure. Okay. Um, so if, unless anybody else wants to say anything to Eric, we'll move on. Anyone else? Eric, this is George. What did you have done to your back? They fused five vertebrae, T2 through, through T6, and they scraped out the cancer they could find in them. Oh, okay. Um, 
I had the same thing, except it was from T11 to all the way down to the pelvis. Wow. So I had 40. How long ago was that? My, my, my scar was longer than your scar. <laughs> I had two. I, I had, at first I had L2 to L5 and it never, it never fused. So what, what that consisted of was continuous pain after the surgical, you know, the, the surgical pain should have subsided. And, and that was because of all the ADT and the, it just had a lot of things against healing um, and the chemo and the radiation and all, all that stuff. So I had to, you know, I had the first one and then a year, a year, a year and a half later, I had the bigger one, the more extensive one, which now that I'm off ADT has, feels like it's, it's healing very well. So it's, it's just, it's just limited my movement, um, which I can deal with. So it takes time though. It takes a lot of time. And, and I had those same symptoms of, you know, just not feeling well when I stand up and, you know, you know I did a lot of sitting down and laying down. So that really weakens you um, and, and you get some atrophy going on. And, uh, you know, I talk to Rick about this all the time about the exercise and it's, uh, <clears throat> and you know, Cancer in the spine is, is no joke. It's uh, it, it really knocks you down. So I, I understand the feeling. Right. So, Dr. George, do you do you think that this weakness um, that that Eric feels after taking 20 steps or so? might not be a heart related issue but might might be more related to the surgery well like i said i i you know i mean i i i had a lot of pain after the surgery and my surgeon said the same thing you know you'll be you'll be walking and you know you'll be fine in six months you'll be you know back to work and everything and you know when he told me in nine months i was still on uh, high doses of opiates and um, you know, I, I had a lot of neurologic symptoms in my legs, so I had a lot of neuropathy because the, uh, the the cancer was compressing on the spinal cord, so I, I didn't have much room. So he took out as much cancer as he could, and like you, like he did to you, he just he just took the whole spine and infused it. You know, he put he put the rods. I don't know if you saw your X-ray, but mine has a lot of you know rods in it, screws in it plates i mean you know it's like the bionic back um so you know the really important part is the healing and that's you know i mean that's that's you know the healing is what's you know what needs to happen um you know but i i was very weak you know but, but i had that first and then i had the adt at the same time i had the uh the chemo I had radiation of my spine and um, I got anemic. So I, I, had a, I had a rough time, but it took me a long time to, to feel better. Um, and I, you know, I couldn't explain it to anybody. I saw a guy yesterday uh, who's just started ADT and he, uh, he used the word, I feel obliterated. And I said, you know, I've been trying to look for that word for four years to explain how I feel. And you just said it, <laughs> obliterated. Mm -hmm. But if you have AFib with you know a low heart rate, you really need to get that checked out. And sometimes there, there's a specialty in cardiology that some some cardiologists do just do uh, uh, electrophysiology, where they actually take a wire and they go and find the spot that's causing the atrial fibrillation, and they zap it, and you get back into a normal sinus rhythm. So, you know, that's, that's an option too. I mean, you really got to rule out heart problems. Uh, you know, I mean, those are the most serious things. If it's just atrophy and the surgery thing, um, you know, that'll get better with time. Um, I'm, I've never heard of this cardio oncology thing. That's, that's pretty cool. Okay. Well, there's, there's a lot more that we could go into this, but I think we, where we should move on. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Eric. And you know, next time 
we'll, we'll, we'll spend more on it next time, but I do want to move on because I want to make sure we get everybody covered here. Um, Jeff Marchi, you had a question for us. Well, not a question. I was going to make some comments about a, a, I, I did a search on the web about hot flashes because I, it, 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 it was the point where I'm getting of every couple of hours at night, I'm getting soaked. And uh, I saw one thing that said, uh, you know, drink, drink ice water. Well, I've tried it for a week now. And uh, I have many fewer flat, hot flashes. When I feel one come on, I have to drink about six or seven gulps of a very icy water right away. Sometimes I'll start to sweat a little bit, but it'll stop. Other times it'll stop immediately. It has made a, a, just a considerable difference because I used to get weak every time I'd feel one, and I'm not getting that anymore. Not only that, but they've re it's reduced. It seems to have reduced the frequency at night. I'm not getting them as frequent, and uh, I'm, I'm, it's uh, I'm not taking. I'm not drinking ice water at night, but I'm literally running out. I'm drinking. The, I'm drinking the ice out quicker than my fr my uh, ice maker can make it in my refrigerator. But uh, it's it just phenomenal fix for me because uh, it was getting it, it, it's been getting pretty serious i uh I'll, but one one comment about that my uh i had just about a month ago got another lupron shot and i found that after having six months for the six month shot for the next month my my testosterone level did not go up more than 10 points. It went from 20 to 30 in a month. So it may be that this additional shot just just killed me by you know over overdosing me, and I'm now starting to come off of it. But the ice water really makes a difference. You know, in my case, I have not found. I have found yes, ADT has just has reduced my desires. But if I see a pretty girl, I still think. And I'm still horny at least a couple of times a week if I think about it. Um, and I found that I can still, if, if properly stimulated, have it almost exactly as tense a climax as I had before. But you have to have a partner with you to do that. It's, uh, and I cannot get an erection anymore. So it's uh, just, just as a comment. But the ice water thing, I just could not believe it. It was the last thing in a list of a whole bunch of things to resolve hot flashes, and it's just phenomenal. I, I drink six or eight gulps, uh, maybe maybe six ounces of very cold water, and it just, and you can, people can tell I'm having it because my head turns red. Anybody, um, has, has anybody else heard of that or tried it, or would anybody else like to say anything about hot flashes? You stunned them. No. <laughs> yeah, when I well, have hot flashes, I, I just taking a taking a cold, uh, taking a like a washcloth, uh, dip it in ice water, and I just lay it right on top of my head. Of course, I don't have any hair to get in the way, so you know <laughs> the circulation of my blood is directly contacting the the cold uh, washcloth. The other guys <laughs> might be challenged on that one. <laughs> I live in I live in San Francisco, and it's usually around 60 here. So mm. I've been very fortunate that you know we almost never hit 70. I keep cool all the time as a result. I, I, I I'm just really worried if I go to a place where it's hotter. But uh, I've not found what you're talking about to work for me. I get so hot, I literally turn bright red. And I get so hot, I start sweating all the way down my back, my head. My, I, I'm, I'm sweating off the top of my head. That it's dripping off my forehead, and the ice water just stops it. Okay. Uh, this is a bear. Let me make a comment. Usually, immediately after having a Lupron shot, it seems that the hot flashes are more intense. And the other, as as you were mentioning, environmental. Uh, I was out today, and it was 90. I was talking to Rick before. 95 plus degrees plus humidity and it seems in that environment they are worse and more frequent that's it has, has anybody on this call tried acupuncture 
I did read about one person that found it successful for them. I, and I, I was looking through lists. That's uh, what led me to the ice waters. Well, you know, the, 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 there are reports, we've discussed it here, so we're not going to go into it today, that acupuncture does work, and I suggest it to you all. Um, I, I sense resistance, but I have to say that, you know, it is a very benign treatment, not as benign as the ice water, which also has the double effect of drinking water, which is, we know, very good for you. But um, I, I'm going to keep pushing that, that um, the, the, the acupuncture, acupuncture. Yeah. until I hear somebody telling me. And even then, you know, everybody's different. But I do think that there's a benefit to, uh, to trying it. So and, and the downside is, is not very much. Um, OK, um, any, any other comments on, from anybody on hot flashes before we move on? Okay, so let, let's go on to uh, Dr. George. Um, what did you have on your mind, George? Um, and, you know, was, I, I can probably wait till next time. I just, um, uh, I had a question about my, my slowly rising PSA, which it's, um, it's slowly going up, but I have a normal prostate and I'm off the ADT and my testosterone is up. So um, I think it's just that it's um, the prostate is starting to work now. It's still under 0.2. It's uh, like 0.12, but it's been slowly going up over the last uh, couple, few months. Um, so, you know, the concern is, is, is this a recurrence or is this a... Uh, just my prostate coming back to life again and um you know what's what's the what's the uh you know what's the cutoff where you get worried so and, what uh, what is your psa right now george the last one was 0. 0.122 okay um you know this is this is a tricky one and um i'd like maybe len to talk about this because you know, it sort of, it, it's, it, it really addresses um, intermediate, in, intermittent ADT. Um, you know, you start ADT, you come off of ADT. Um, and for those of you that have had no treatment, uh, you, you, your prostate um, is going to respond to that. Um, how, Len, how, how do you think you, you, you can, address, I know it's different for you because you've had some radiation at this point, but how would, what would you suggest to George about, um, monitoring his PSA, um, as he, as his, as it starts to rise now? George, just quickly, what were the treatments you've had so far? Um. Uh, I had the initially the uh, the combination therapy with enzalutamide and Firmagon for two years. Um, you know, metformin, uh, Avidart. I had estrogen patches, uh, so and so forth. And after um, a couple of years, I my my PSA remained undetectable. So, uh, and my I had a clean bone scan and a clean CAT scan. So. You know, I, I, I wanted to come off the uh, the uh, the ADT, which I did, and um, I've been off it now for two years, and my PSAs have all been, you know, I mean at the undetectable level, but it's taken a, a while for my testosterone to to come back, and uh, so okay, I'll, so your your case is. As Rick said, it's different than mine <clears throat> because I had radiation therapy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> following um, radiation therapy, uh, my PSA nadir was 0 0.1. Then over a period of, um, I think it was about nine or 10 months, it, it went slowly upward to 0 0.5. 
And <clears throat> then my oncologist said, sometimes I've seen this happen where uh, the PSAs will plateau out at about 0.5. So he said, before we do anything, let's continue monitoring the PSA and see what happens. So after that, my PSA remained at 0.5 for the next six months. And on the seventh month, it actually dropped a little bit to 0.43. Mm. Um, I don't know how and that I, might relate to your situation, but. Well, what, what, the, uh, what the complicating thing is I had a, uh, they were considering a prostatectomy. Uh, and I, so I had a prostate biopsy in November of, last, of 2017. And it did go up after that uh, to 0.12, and then it dropped back down, and then it started to come up again. So it's, uh, you know, so you know, so the thought was that it, the PS, the actual biopsy could have, you know, caused a slight rise in the PSA, and then it went down, and now that the prostate function is coming back, um, that you know that I should be like follow, you know, just, just closely following the PSAs. I, I don't want to go back on the ADT. I'll be honest with you. I'd rather right. take back to tear for a year than go back on ADT, but um, I will, if I have to, uh, you know, if my PSA goes up to uh, a certain level, but I don't think that I, I've not seen any studies where it says, uh, uh, you know, there's a book by Mark Garnick that says, you know, people with prostatectomies, if it, if you get two uh, two levels up past point two, and you've had a radical prostatectomy, then that's significant. You should go back. You know, you should look for, you know, a cancer and and start ADT again. But that's not my case. I I am a I am a virgin pro. I have a, I guess I'm a, I'm a virgin prostate. Right. Right. I, I would I would suggest or you know talk to your oncologist. It, it might be wise to let it rise if it continues to just wait. If it continues to rise, wait till it gets to a point where the more sensitive scans can pick up what's going on and then get rescanned and then decide what to do. Yeah, I, I, that's what I want to do. Um, yeah. I mean, I had metastatic disease everywhere, so um, I feel like I've I've done very well and um right but if the scan shows that you have lesions outside the prostate you certainly don't want to bother doing a prostatectomy oh right not, right right because I they couldn't find any in the prostate and I guess that's not unusual uh with metastatic disease but the the studies now are they're, they're doing now they're showing that uh an increased survival in um taking out the prostate in newly diagnosed metastatic disease to kind of debulk the tumor and, uh, you know, prevent the chance of another another cancer coming back uh, from the prostate. And it, it seems to be prolonging survival. At least the, the studies are showing that. So, um, I haven't seen that. So, George, we, um, you know, we, we've had a couple of guys do that. Dr. Steve, for example, had um, had his prostate radiated after the chemotherapy. Um, there was it, it, it was contentious um, because there are studies for and studies against debulking the primary. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to, by the way. I mean, you, you, you were talking about a prostatectomy. You can do the same thing with radiation. Uh, and it's it's a little less invasive. Um, where's your where's your uh, testosterone level? It's uh, about five hundred. Okay, so you know, and I, I wanna, and I, I, I want to have and I want to have sex. Okay, so uh, you know, I I do think um, Len's advice to discuss it with your medonk is good, and that ties into what you and I have been talking about. That you've really got to get a good um, GU medon quarterbacking your treatment. Um, did you? You were going to reach out to Chris Sweeney. Have you? Have you done that? Uh, yeah, uh, and I have. I actually have an appointment on the July third. Good. 
So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting my records together. Now my prior physician uh, wrote, sent a letter saying she was going to be leaving, and then I get a call back saying now she's moving from New Jersey to Mount Sinai in New York. Um, so I don't know. Um, she's on the verge of retiring, so it would be nice to have a younger, younger doctor. Um, just because I don't want to have that worry about you know my doctor retiring and then having to find another doctor. So um, I'm, I'm going to go to you know, both appointments and, and, and see, you know, what, what, what each of them think about the, the, the situation. Well, Lens, Lens at Mount Sinai with Dr. O. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can talk to, to him a little bit about Mount Sinai. Um, my feeling is that Chris Sweeney is one of the best in the country. And I think that in terms of your situation, particularly where you don't want to go back on ADT um, and you're looking at other alternatives, number one. Um, uh, number two, um, it's Dana-Farber, which is a great hospital. Mm -hmm. um, and that they, have a, they have a really good, um, genomic cap capability there um you know i and and like he's, he's quite a bit younger um and you know you've got this really special issue about still being in having an intact prostate and, and trying to figure out when to go back on treatment and what treatment i know if it were me um i wouldn't be talking to um an older gu med on um, Dr. Ferrari, wasn't that who you were seeing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I think, I, to me, my money would be on my money would be on uh, uh, would be on Sweeney. And yeah, don't uh, they have those tumor boards where they have uh, they have conferences with complicated cases that yeah. they discuss? You know, if, if they're not sure what to do. Yeah, and you know, the other thing is that. Um, uh, Professor Bill has had a great experience at Dana Farber recently. Not that you wouldn't have a good experience at Mount Sinai. I'm not saying that, but um, but he's been really happy with uh, with Dana Farber. And of course, as we recently discovered, they have a cardio oncologist there. <laughs> I'll find out who it is. Oh, we know. That's the one I mentioned. What's his name, Doctor oh. uh, Andrew Noria? Director of the Cardio Oncology Program. So there you go. Can't All go right. Wrong. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll let you know what what happens. Okay. Uh, Rick, can I ask George a question? Quick question. Sure. George, how long have you been? Uh, when were you diagnosed? What was the diagnosis? And how long have you been? Have you been fighting this? Uh, four years ago, I I was diagnosed with. Um, metastasis to my ribs, pelvis, femur, and my whole spine. And I, I had a spinal cord compression at L3. So I had surgery right away, radiation. I started on the ADT with Firmagon um, w once a month. And I got the, uh, and then when I started seeing Dr. Myers, I, I got enzalutamide added to that with Avidart, metformin, and a bunch of supplements. Okay. So I was aggressively treated. But when you say I, surgery, George, when you say surgery and radiation, not to your prostate. To your no, I had, I had the, uh, the surgery was to my spine, like I said, the fusion. Right. And I had the radiation to the spine. So right. I didn't have any prostate radiation. Right, right, right. Because most of the time when we on this call, when we talk about surgery, surgery and radiation up front. Right, we're, right, we're, right. We're talking about prostate, but yours was focused on the spine. Yeah, I just think I have a virgin prostate. Yeah. Oh, well. Think of that. OK. <laughs> OK. Is it, is it a male or a female virgin? <laughs> I wish I hope it's a female. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, all right, let me just, um, I know we've got a couple of people on the phone. Um, I'm wondering if one of them is Peter. 
One of them is Peter. Oh, Peter, how did it go? Tell us. I told everybody that you were, uh, I told everybody that you just did an interview. Tell us how it went. Went excellent. It was, it was really good. I'll, I'll uh, try to get a, I'll try to get a, a, a copy of it on a on a, uh, a flash drive tomorrow, and uh, I'll figure out how to get it around. Okay, thank you. And what was the interview about? Oh, pretty much about everything: ANCAN, prostate, advocacy. Just a just a general uh, overview of what my life is, what my passion is. Uh, you, uh, all of us, you guys. You know, it was it was great. You'll, you'll hear it. Fantastic. And did you want to raise anything special today, Peter? No, I just had a question for George just now. When he said he had a biopsy, was that of his uh, his tumors on his spine, or was it of of, of his prostate? And what was well, how was it ranked? Well, the the initial was on the the spine, the bone in the spine, and it was a Gleason eight. Um, okay. Yeah, and then the, the prostate biopsy was about six months ago. Wow. Which was negative. Okay. And that was negative. Okay. Yeah. That, Amazing. That, Amazing. Yeah, no, they were all surprised. Yeah, that was the yeah. same thing that Dr. Steve had. Dr. Steve's prostate biopsy was negative after he did his chemo. Yeah. Peter, I have a question. Do we, uh, now that you've been on TV, do we have to go through your agent and pay union rates to talk to you from now on? <laughs> of course, I got a, I got my SAG card already. <laughs> <laughs> just, just just remember, give us a cut rate when, when we talk to you, for old time's mm -hmm. sake. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, and who is the other person on the telephone? Would you like to identify? Okay. Um, Jay Mills is here. Yeah. Oh, hi, Jay Mills. Did you need any hey. time tonight? Uh, I could make a quick comment. Uh, some okay. Point. We'll come back. We'll come back to you. We'll, we'll just squeeze in these last guys. Um, Bill Franklin, okay. you wanted to talk about testosterone coming back. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or not coming back is the problem. <laughs> no, right. um, yeah, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about uh, getting my, you know, getting my test, uh, but I didn't get the results because my doctor, uh, after the blood draw, he went to uh, Taiwan to visit his father. He's uh, he's Chinese, or I guess Taiwanese. He might take offense to that. I don't know. But um, so when he did get back, I got the results. So uh, my last testosterone uh, was slowly building. It was up near 200. Uh, it dropped 75 points between then and now, three months. So my testosterone went down. And I had been feeling a little sluggish and tired, and I, you know, didn't know what was wrong with me. Still doing all my exercises, going to karate and all that stuff. Uh, has, has anybody else had an experience uh, when recovering after coming off of ADT? With a kind of a roller coaster uh, testosterone, or has no one seen this before? I did, but my levels were higher. But it was definitely a roller coaster. Um, yeah, I did. I did a lot of web searching. I couldn't find any like real medical stuff or clinical trials. I saw a lot of anecdotal, you know, comments on uh, the websites and stuff that we we frequent, and but uh, no studies about, you know, it. Yeah, that, the there, are lot, there are a lot of studies, Bill, um, and I, the reason I know that is because around, I don't know about recently, but this was around 2010, 2011, 2010, I think, 2011, I researched uh, studies on PSA patterns um, after coming off uh, neoadjuvant uh, Lupron, and um, there was almost nothing. I don't think there was nothing on PSA, but there were a bunch of studies on how testosterone comes back. So, um, if you go to PubMed, have you tried, okay. have you tried PubMed? And yeah, I actually, I, I maybe I didn't read far enough into my found studies about testosterone coming back. I I I was looking specifically for information about 
the you know the yo-yo or roller coaster whatever you want to call it of it going up and coming down you know in the progress uh, a lot of the studies had like charts and graphs on the steady progression versus okay versus going up know. and down yeah. I, I i didn't look at going up and down so maybe you found what i saw yeah. i mean i can only tell you about my own case and then we'll ask every, everyone else on the call but in my case um I finished, I got my last shot in February. No, I'm sorry. It wore off in around February of 2011. And I think, um, maybe, yeah, 2011, that's right. And my PSA, uh, excuse me, my testosterone was still less than 50 in the August. And then in the May, in the May, and then in the August, it started to come back. And I think it was around my baseline, which was around 700. Um, and then it went up, it got as high as about 1,000. And then it dropped down to 300. And um, mm -hmm. I think it was there for two sessions. And I talked to my doc about supplementing testosterone. And I used Androgel, um, for, which was really messy and yucky, for about six months or eight months. And it made no, it had no impact at all. And then, um, my testosterone came just came back again, and I think it's been around five to seven hundred ever since. Huh. So I mean, it probably took um, it probably took three to four years after I finished after my last shot for me to to get back to a stable level. Yeah, I'm so, going on. Yeah, I'm going on a year. So right. Uh, right. Which, if it takes that long, it takes that long. It's, uh, I I definitely feel a lot better than I did when I was in the middle of ADT, but yeah. I would like a little bit more, possibly. <laughs> well, um, I spoke to my urologist. I talked with my urologist, who was great. I, I uh, even though I never had any, um, I, I never had a, a, any uh, interventionary treatment from him for my prostate. Um, I stuck with him right the way through because he was such a good guy and he was knowledgeable and I really felt I didn't need a GU med on. Um, and because I was progressing well. Um, I mean, I think the, the discussion you, that you may need to have would be either with your urologist. If you, do you have a GU med on? Did you ever put one in place? Yeah. Yeah, he was uh, also uh, my the the guy who did my radiation. So, so he's a radiation oncologist. Uh, yeah, as well as a nasal urinary uh, oncologist. Oh, so he also has an internal medicine qualification. Huh? Yep. Um, and he well, was a partner. He's partner with my normal urologist, so they were in the same. They were in the same. Uh, right. Same same practice. So. Well, you know, I I would talk to him. Um, uh, see how see what he says i mean he's probably going to say it's still a little early the one thing that they told me about testosterone is that it varies tremendously on any given day you know you mm -hmm. can get a reading 300 points apart from one day to the next and depending on what time of day that you, you you gave blood well you'll like to hear this he told me to exercise more and lose weight <laughs> <laughs> And I said, I can't exercise more. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm wearing myself out. Three, I'm wearing myself out three to four days a week. I need the other. I need the other two or three to recover. So you gave him a kung fu kick in the chops and said, I can't exercise anymore. Right? Yeah. Well, he's Chinese, so I, I you know, I was careful about it. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, guys, has has anyone else who had adjuvant, um neoadjuvant or adjuvant hormone therapy um hormone therapy or maybe who came off after intermittent 
Um, what's your experience been in your testosterone coming back? Mine came back and it bounced around between 250 and 400 a little bit. I mean, I can't remember the exact figures, but it, it did go up and down. Oh, do you know what your baseline was, Peter? Do you remember? Did you ever know your baseline? I never knew my baseline. No, I never I never did that test initially. So, um, But I used to check it every month and I noticed it was fluctuation when I was on, when I was on intermittent. When I was when I was off off treatment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and of course you're a few years older than than you know, 15 years older or so than than um, uh, than Bill, so you have to take that into account. Anyone else? Um, and how long did that take, uh, Peter? Before it, you know when it came back, how, roughly how long? Mine came back in about three or four months on that time. So. Okay. If I go off again, I, I don't know. Now you know, now I'm on Zytiga. I, I sometimes wonder, I, I need to do a testosterone test because I find I have a lot of energy and I go to the gym for an hour, hour and a half, four days a week. I mean, I, I feel great. And I've been on Zytiga and Lupron for three months now. So I, I don't know what's going on. That's one of my questions because <laughs> I'm not uh, getting tested for testosterone now. But I, I hope but it stays I, uh, that way for I you, Pete. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Anyone else want to talk about testosterone coming back um, and how long it took after they um, went off ADT? Yeah, this is George. I also had a lot of roller coaster ride until. Uh, well, I'm still having them. I had um, 300 a month, uh, 300 two months ago, and then 600 a month ago. So they've been doing that for two years now, and, uh, and my libido is still down. And, and I heard to I heard it for every year you're on the ADT. It takes at least one year of, of recovery, and I was on it for two years. So yeah, I've heard that too. Just yeah, seems to be like I yet. said. Seems to be the anecdotal uh, comment on a lot of the websites and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I want to I want to see the study. You know, the... <laughs> well, you know what? I think I don't know. It must be a difference between young guys and old guys, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I still have a libido, no problem. I just have low testosterone. <laughs> right. so, I would be happy with something between three and six hundred uh, right now. I'll tell you what. So, I mean, I feel good now. It's a it's a it's a hundred and 15 like was what it was at the last one right so i feel fine right now i don't recover as much as quickly as i did before uh and yeah that was uh what i'm going on three years now you know uh, september will be three years when i was diagnosed so in 2015 three years ago when i had workouts and stuff uh, i recovered very quickly i i ran and i i did other things um of course after the treatment and going through all that stuff, I, I I went back. I got into karate with my kids and stuff. Uh, I I don't recover like I did three years ago, not yet. Now, hopefully, I do get there, because I'm still relatively young. I don't feel young a lot of days, but 55 is not not that old. I'm 55 too, Bill. Yeah. So I I. Bill, if I was you, if you have a libido, <clears throat> I wouldn't worry about my testosterone. The testosterone is what takes away, or the lack of testosterone is what kills your libido in the first place. So if you've got a libido now, and who cares what your what your uh, yeah. as long as you can get an erection, as long as you're interested, I, who cares I'm, what I'm, the number is? Because everybody's number is different. Everybody's normal. That's true. Different. I was just hoping for that little bit extra of. Uh, yeah, Bill, Bill, Bill. I, I, I didn't mean that. Extra, I meant that little bit extra manly. I know. No, I meant that little bit extra of that energy boost, recovery from exercise. I didn't mean that little bit extra. You're not thinking <laughs> of taking testosterone, are you? No, no. Uh, my doctor said oh, it, he won't, he okay. won't even think about uh, testosterone supplements yet because it, it has been only a year since I went off ADT. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I was two to three years out before my doc said try it, but it didn't do anything for me. It made, made absolutely no difference. Mm. So, so when I figured that out, I just chucked the stuff away. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so there you go. 
Any anyone else want to say anything to Bill before we 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 move on to Jake and and Jay Mills or the last two up? Well, I'll just end my uh, comments uh, with uh, I found out that Moffitt Cancer Center uh, opened the first Florida cardio oncology center in September 2015, so almost three years ago. Okay. So I was I I looked it up to see if Moffitt had one, and it's been there for three years almost. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, very good. We know, God forbid, anybody in uh, North Florida needs uh, has these issues. We will definitely refer them there. Um, OK, Jake, you're up. <clears throat> OK, um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm living on a 30 year old mattress. I bought it when my, my younger son was a year old. So it's it's long past its its shelf life. Um, both of my boys have you know very nicely offered to buy me a new one in the thousand dollar range, and I'm driving myself nuts just trying to find a figure on you know what's the best one. And uh, you know, do you need an inner spring? Do you need is the phone better? You know, and I'm I'm trying to think in terms of the future when I have when my prostate cancer gets worse. You know, you know, getting out of bed, um, hot flashes is, is another one. Foam, for example, is supposed to be bad for for heat. So I was just wondering if anybody had any suggestions or ideas or what 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 you bought lately or if you know anything about mattresses. Jake, it's Dennis. Uh, with my diagnosis and prognosis and everything, uh, we went out and bought uh, Tempur Pedic adjustable. Uh, definitely not in the thousand dollar range, so unfortunately. Right. Uh, but the the adjustability I found, I think you could get them a lot less. Uh, there's another manufacturer out there that's not as elaborate as this one, but has a lot of adjustability to it, and that has been very helpful, uh, mostly through my treatments uh, when I was having digestive issues and so forth. You know, the the head comes up. And for a time being, when I was, again, going through treatments and chemo and so forth, did a lot of uh, meditation type stuff. And I, I really loved that bed during that time period where you have what they call a zero gravity adjustability to it. You know, your feet are raised up, your butt is down and your head is up and so forth. Uh, I, I would, that, that would just really do it for me. Uh, the foam mattresses i think tend to be a little warmer uh right. the newer ones some of the newest ones have what they call more air ventilation through it that's just through the design of it there's not no actual real uh, powered air movement or anything right uh the other thing that i found out and i uh, what i've read on about sheets and of course i live in a hot climate here in arizona and unfortunately the sheets that i we bought to fit uh, this bed uh, was, uh, it felt good at the time. They're seeing very thin and so forth. But from what I've read, they, you don't want to get real expensive sheets because the weave is too tight and they don't breathe as well from a standpoint of a, you know, starting a hot flashes to come on. Mm. Uh, so you want something less expensive sheet with a, not as tight a weave so the air can move through the, through the sheet. Okay. Well, yeah, I know about Tempur Pedic, but those, like you said, they're very expensive. You can spend three or four thousand dollars by the time you get the mattress and the bed and the uh, frame, and that's just out of my range. All right. Well, Jake, this is the bear. I can again speak firsthand experience. Uh, my wife and I bought uh, same type bed that Dennis was talking about. Uh, zero gravity, uh, lift the head, lift the foot. You know, infinitely adjustable. Um, now, I don't have the name of the particular mattress, but they are um, adjustable. I'd say probably 100 inserts, and you can adjust where you want it to be hard and soft. My wife has all that information. She's not available right now, but I will get that information to you. However, cost, uh, and this was online, uh, was probably over $6,000, my side and my wife's side, individual yeah. sides. Nothing the Casper cheap. mattress is what you want to look at. It's top rated in Consumer Reports. 
They're price range from five hundred dollars for a twin, eight fifty for a queen, nine fifty for a king. I'm reading on the web right now, and if Consumer Reports, they were like number one rated foam mattress. What's it called? I have a yeah. Tempur-Pedic with all the the top and bottom move up and down. I never use the bottom. And the top, the problem with adjusting the top is you're constantly sliding down. My wife and I both have the same problem. It takes everything down the whole, the sheets, the padding, everything slowly slides. But the Casper is the one. Check it out. Oh, yeah, that's one of the ones I'm looking at, yes. Um, okay. Thank no you. That, that's, like I said, my boys, you know, I'm on, I'm on, a, on a fixed retirement income. I don't have much money. Uh, my boys both have good jobs and they offered to, to buy me a my mattress, which I'm super grateful for. But as you know, they had to set a limit and three, four, six, six thousand dollars. It just be too much to ask. So. So yeah. I'm looking more like at the Casper in the 500 to a thousand dollar range. Um, Bill, Frank, can you put a note on the um, on the chat? Yeah, the only other yeah, suggestion the, uh, is Jake is really. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on a second, Dennis. Let uh, let let me bed. go, and then I'll come to you. Yeah, I was gonna say the sleep number beds is definitely outside that price range that you quoted. Um, yeah. But it is. Uh, it's also has like the zero gravity thing. I, I got the the adjustable one, but we got the one that both sides are adjustable. Uh, so it's almost like two, you know, two singles next to each other. Uh, but the thing about that is they do have active cooling and heating systems on them. But again, they're they're much more expensive than that, more like the five thousand dollar range. Once you get put all those bells and whistles on there. Yeah. Um, but uh, in the other bedroom, I have a different mattress, and I can't for the life of me remember uh, what kind it was. But it's a very comfortable bed, which I replaced a very old mattress. Uh, I'll, I'll pull the sheets off it and see if I can find the tag. <laughs> Okay. It just the name of it eludes me. I thought Casper, but I don't. Then I started thinking I didn't. I didn't go with the Casper, so uh, I'll have to, like I said, pull the sheets off and look at the the tag on it. I'll, I'll email it to you. Okay. Well, but, thank uh, it's, you. It's, it's very comfortable. I actually bought the wrong size originally, just by not even thinking, you know, not measuring the bed or anything. I looked at. It, I thought it was a. I thought it was a full size, and it was a queen. I ordered the full size, and it came and. I called the company back and they gave me a really good deal uh, on buying a queen and for, they gave me a discount on the queen for buying two beds versus, you know, returning one and then getting a new one. And I right. took the full and put it on my son's bed. So uh, it worked out. I got the queen at like half price. So, but uh, I'll, I'll look at the tag and tell you what it is. Uh, they're both really, I think they're very comfortable. So thank you. Dennis. Yeah, the last bit of uh, suggestion is to, to really try them out. If you're going to order one online, see if, you, if there's a store locally that has it. Uh, bring your own pillow with you. Uh, and depending whether you are a back sleeper or a side sleeper or a stomach sleeper, uh, that's important too. Uh, and that can be even your pillow selection could be affected by that. Yeah, I was going to say that most of the online ones that they'll let you try it for 90 days. Yeah. And if at the 89th day you say, I don't like it, they'll send a truck and the guys will pick it up. No, and that, this is the bear. We had the same thing. It was 100 days. And uh, yeah. supposedly we investigated and they made good on that. You know, just oh, as an aside, you know what's sad about that? Um, it makes you wonder how much these things are actually worth because they will take the mattresses back. But they, but they, or, or they, they will refund your money, but they don't take the mattresses back. They can't sell them, so, so they, they can, just they basically give them away. Yeah, they donate them. <laughs> they may yeah. sell them again. You don't know. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, true. <laughs> so Jake, if you're really cheap, you could go my, you know, my direction. I am. I am. Yeah, Gary. I have a really what I would call. I don't know the brand name, but I think it's called Shitty Mattress. And um, so I put a Tempur-Pedic, a really good Tempur-Pedic topper on it. And that's it. And it was on sale at one of those big box stores, you know. So it was only about $100. And um, I've never, ever had any issues ever since. 
except when I go on vacation. I hate vacations because they always put you on a hard bed and it's miserable. So I'm going to stay home for the rest of my life and sleep on my good mattress. <laughs> yeah, it really it works. On your it's, shitty mattress. <laughs> yeah, on my shitty mattress with my Tempur Pedic topper, and I'm like, it's fantastic. So that's it. Jake, uh, Jake, whatever you do, whatever you do, Jake, don't remove the tag because you'll end up doing time in a federal prison and they'll take your children away. <laughs> <laughs> and then you will be sleeping on a shitty mattress. Yeah. That used to scare me to death when I was a kid. I saw that tag and I go, oh my God, what do I do? <laughs> or what if I take it off in my sleep or something? <laughs> All right. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I, I appreciate that. I, you know, it's, there are just so many choices out there. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, one guy says, oh, this is too firm. One says it's too soft. You know, it's like Goldilocks. You know, the next guy says, oh, it's hot. It's cold. Um, it's, it's lumpy. It's not lumpy. It, it's you can't get a good you know reading the reviews. You can't really get a consistency, unfortunately. If you but. just want to go get the topper and you don't like it, you take it back to the store and they take it right back. That's all there is to it. How thick is the topper? Uh, well, mine's I think three inches. Three inches. That's my topper. My topper is three inches. Yeah. But you have to have a you have something underneath it. Oh yeah, my regular shitty mattress shitty is underneath it. The problem with the problem I have a shitty mattress too. It's thirty years old, literally. Um, <laughs> but it's it's got it's got a, a dip in it. It's, you, know, <laughs> you know, visualize the whirlpool in the ocean. Well, I, there's, there's you, you know, my, but my you butt know, you falls get a new into this every night. You get a Jake, new mattress and you're gonna miss that dip. I tell you what, you're gonna miss it. <laughs> Jake, they tell you usually the life of a mattress is ten years. Anything beyond that, you're sleeping on trash. I know. <laughs> but uh, Gary named it or called it earlier. You know, if you're cheap, <laughs> yes I am. No. If you're poor, yes I am. <laughs> so no, the the word is parsimonious. Forget cheap, really. <laughs> That's our, right. that's our word. That's our word for the week, Gary. Parsimonious. Parsimonious. Yes. On, yeah. on the conversation. <laughs> Rick the Bear, I'm going to shout out one word. I don't know if you discussed Yanza, Y-O-N-S-A, I believe. Yeah, we, we don't have time to discuss it right now. Um, but, but hold on to it, and we'll talk about it next time. We talked about it, I think, last time or the time before. So if you, go and look right. at the, uh, if you go and look at the recordings, you'll find it. I think we named it. Um, or use the fancy new keyword search and put in Yanza, and you'll find it. I want oh, to. No, tell I, you, I, want I wonder to tell if you, anybody had first-hand information on it. Yeah, That's what I, mean. we, I, I uh, it's, 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 it's ten minutes after, and I want to touch base right. with Jay. Jay, tell us yeah. what's going on. Have you made a decision? Yes, I have, and uh, well, <laughs> okay. I have. Uh, yeah, we'll talked with. Uh, I think the two two last people I talked with were. Uh, by, by phone with Sweeney and with uh, in person with uh, Brad Stish and uh, decided to go uh, radiation route and went on ADT last week, went on uh, Degerelix. Oh, good. Okay, so yep. you, so what radiation um, are you going to do? What what combination? Right. A combination of uh, HD, HDR and IMRT. And you're going to do much. that? Um, and you're going to do that at um, at uh, Mayo in. Um, that that's what I'm. Uh, so yes, I'm, that's what I've planned right now. But I'm, at the same time, I'm uh, studying uh, who else might be I might consider for that. But yes, I'm scheduled scheduling with Brad Stish. Okay. So the only the only word of. Um, advice warning etc etc that i would want to give you if you decide to go with stish is if yeah. it were me i would still want a gu medonk outside of the mayo system and I'm, just, I'm working with yeah okay and that's I what mean, i that's what i have with uh with uh swing yeah 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 yeah. yeah um uh that's an issue that um that les shelter who I don't know if Les ever got his microphone working today. I think he's not on the call anymore. No, he's still. Oh, Les! I, I'm still here. 
you're still there. We tried to touch base with you before to see if you wanted to talk, but we couldn't get you. So, so sorry. Are you still there? Come back on there. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. No, I, for some reason, I didn't hear your request or your call. Oh, okay. Well, did, did you have something you wanted to talk about? I'm sure the guys will hang in for a few extra minutes after we're done with Jay. Uh, no, not really. I wanted to thank you for the, all your information. Uh, I still haven't made a decision, but I certainly appreciate all your input. Uh, there's there's a few other issues that I'm dealing with that could uh, throw the balance one way or the other, but uh, I certainly appreciate your input. Okay, well, hopefully next next Tuesday we'll talk to you a little bit more, but I just would like you to pass on some of your experience um at mayo um to um to jay because he's considering using brad stish for uh, hdr and imrt well uh my the mayo that i went to is in rochester minnesota i don't know which one he was headed for yeah same one is it okay with uh eugene kwan uh, was a urologist. Uh, I've been satisfied with him uh, most of the time. The the last uh, issue we had, I didn't think he was answering my questions. That's why I was kind of uh, yeah. at a loss that uh, I had several questions that did not get addressed. And uh, in order to make a decision, I like to have some data. And yeah. I, I was missing <laughs> that. So uh yep. i'm still working on it well i i and i think there was a you know there was a, an issue to the extent that less um wh what was your original treatment i'm just pulling it up i can't remember well the original treatment was uh that they didn't think that uh a uh, surgery was warranted it was too late so they went with the hormone treatment plus external beam radiation mm -hmm. and now mayo says they're going to they uh, propose doing radiation again uh you know that the uh, radiation before was done locally uh, around moline illinois but uh, mayo says that they can do it well uh i still haven't decided Right. So, I mean, I think one of the issues um, for you was that they did um, they did pelvic girdle radiation, um, and now Mayo is saying they can do more pelvic girdle radiation, and that and that's kind of the question for you. Yes. Um, but you did not go to Mayo until your disease came back. Is that correct? I uh, it never really left. Okay, until it never left. And 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 they removed your lymph nodes, and then they did uh, uh, cryoablation cryo on, and... uh, on two spots, uh, cancerous spots on the spine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, and and uh, did, was Brad Stish the radiologist for you? Um, I can't remember the radiologist's name. Okay. Offhand, I don't. That doesn't ring a bell, though. Um, but Jay, I guess what I would like to just say is that I, I, I'm sure Stish is excellent and he has a very good reputation. But my concern for Mayo is that um, they, they have a philosophy with follow up treatment um, that often involves some type of lymphadectomy. So they'll go after the lymph nodes either with radiation or cryo or or surgery and all too often it just seems like a game of whack-a-mole and um so as long as you don't you don't plan on returning there god forbid you should need to and hopefully this will nail it in the first place i would say you're doing good but but don't for me, they would not be the place to go if my disease 
needed additional treatment beyond the primary therapy. Right. So, and I don't know, Les, did, did, did you want to add anything or take anything away from that or disagree with me, which you're perfectly entitled to do? Yeah, I can't disagree, although what I did, I've been with him for over three years and uh, I was initially given less than two years to live and I'm now at about five and a half. So, well, you know. That's good. Yeah. yeah. That's good. As long as I'm staying on the green side of the sod, I figure I've done <laughs> something. <laughs> well, we we need to get you. We need to get you to to one of those three docs that I mentioned to you today. And my, if it were me, I'd be going after either Alicia, Morgan's, who we love on this call, um, uh, uh, Walter Stadler, or Lord uh, or Lloyd uh, Nordquist. I don't think you can go wrong with any one of those three. Uh, the Luke Nordquist that we did go to, he's quite a ways Luke. away from us. Uh, yeah, you know it's. I'm from Illinois and he's from uh, Nebraska. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, go to the guys in, I know the Chicago's a bit of a hike, but go there. But let, let's let um, come back out on Tuesday. Let's, fo let's focus on you and Jay. First of all, I'm really personally relieved that you've made a decision and you've got a shot of, of, of Firmagon to, to kick you off. Um, who, where did you get that shot, Jay? Uh, at uh, Mayo. At Mayo, okay. Yep, Rochester. Okay, and you know, um, I think it's a good plan. You you got a good plan. Let, let's just let's just hope that it works for you. Yeah, um, great. And um, when when do you think you you might start? Two months time. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Are you going to do the HDR first or are you going to do the uh, IMRT first? HDR first, then okay. IMRT. Okay. 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 Well, keep us up to date. Keep coming back here. We'll give you lots of information if you need it. And, hey, Rick. Uh, do you feel, just, just, just one sec, do you feel better? Uh, do you feel any better for having made a decision? Uh, absolutely, much better, much better. Okay. Good, good, good. I mean, I, I felt you would. I mean, I know a lot. Most guys feel like they a load is lifted off their shoulders once they make that decision. So, it is. Um, did you have anything you wanted to ask us? Not, yeah, not today. Uh, okay. Um, Thank you. Hi, Rick. It's okay. Rich Jackson. Oh yes, go ahead, Rich. I uh, was just Jay. Did they mention to you about the space or gel? Uh, yes, I I, I uh, okay. spoken with uh, Brad about that and with other um, uh, radiation oncologists as well. Okay, yeah, it does does seem to help a bit with the IMRT as far as protecting right. protecting the rectum gives you a little bit of distance. Right. Doesn't yeah. doesn't stop the radiation, but it helps move things so that the rectum doesn't get as much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the bringing that up. Yeah. What what's your thought on it, Jay? Uh, that uh, I'm I'm unclear. I think that the uh, that uh, Mac at UCSF is of the opinion that. Uh, it, the only benefit that it gives is the placebo effect. That the that that's the strongest argument that can be made for using it. If you look at the science, if you look at the data from from the better studies, and uh, that there are also concerns that it actually is uh, has uh, side effects, and uh, that. He, he cited one where someone had some, some had a uh, some problem in in the Heidelberg group was using it early on and they had some problem and they were the first to abandon using using it and to uh, argue against using it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, I remember talking with uh, uh, Paul Nguyen 
radiation oncologist at uh, Dana Farber who said that they they did regularly use it and uh, thought it was of of benefit. And then um, I believe that Brad's dish at Mayo says that they regularly use it as well. And, uh, so it uh, I read, read read articles on it and. Uh, uh, studies. I'm not. I'm not convinced that it's beneficial, or, um, but I'm less con less convinced that is that is damaging. So I think there's probably a better to do than not do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I I haven't heard of side effects from it before, but maybe there are. I I don't know what they are, but I and I, I think if I <clears throat> If it would have been available available to me, I would have asked for it, and mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have gotten it because Mac was one of my docs and Kaiser was the other, and I don't think either of them would have approved it. <laughs> so there you go. But it wasn't available back in 2008. So. Right. All right, guys. Well, look. Hey, uh, hey, yes, Rick. Rick. Yeah, it's Brian Heisey. I just wanted to say to Jay, you know, I, I spoke with Jay a little bit um, last week and, you know, whatever decision he makes, wherever he decides to go, I think he's doing the right thing. But, you know, I, I, had, a good, I had a good experience at Mayo. So uh, I also had Brad Stish. I thought he was a good uh, radiation oncologist. And um, they have lots of radiation oncologists. They have lots of urologists. They have lots of people there. So I don't know who Les saw or who Les was dealing with, but... Um, my experience was very good there, and um, you know, I, I hope, hope uh, things work out well for him. I apologize. Yeah, I, wanna... I apologize, I to... Brian. Yeah. Um, I forgot that you had had a great experience, and you did. And didn't you see Quan? What was it? You you were with Quan, right? Yes, yes, I, I saw Quan, and. Um, and I, in fact, I'm going back in, uh, I think, yeah, late, later next week. And I, I know someone locally who also went to see Quan and, and uh, also, you know, had a good experience. But, and, and he actually wanted radiation. Um, he had, he had um, extensive um, metastasis through his whole lymph node system. And he uh, went through Taxotere and, and went back to Mayo, and he wanted radiation to, to eliminate the rest of it, and they actually refused to do it because it, they did not feel that it was um, going to be, uh, you know, a good uh, treatment for him at this time because the, the lymph nodes were not in the right, you know, uh, not in the right place to be treated. So, um, yeah, that kind of it kind of contradicts what you had said earlier, Rick, about whack-a-mole, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I listen, I, I, I stand, I mean, that's why I say if it were me, um, everybody has different responses. I mean, the, the, the big concern to me at, at Mayo is that, you know, if you, if you go to somebody like Quan and you want to have, um, and, and you, you, you have chemotherapy, that he sends you out to somebody else. Was that your case or did you do your... Did you do your chemo at Mayo? No, that was my case. I, I there was someone here locally that he works with. Yeah. Uh, so. So uh, you know, I just always wonder about their GU Medonks in Rochester. I know they've got a couple of decent GU Medonks. They've got a great guy, um, Dr. Singh in Phoenix, um, who Dennis sees and who I've met and who I like very much. But for some reason. I, I don't know who their GU medonks are at Rochester, and you never hear of anybody other than than, than Quan um, treating advanced prostate cancer there. And of course, Quan is not a uh, a medical oncologist; he's a surgeon. Yeah, well, I also know two people who have had very bad experiences at Northwestern Hospital, and I'm not talking about the GU medoc situation i'm talking about other situations where one was paralyzed for life and yeah. the other one you know died 10 years later because of a, a botched operation so you yeah. know northwestern isn't the best hospital either so yeah 
I agree. And, and that's I, why I refuse to go there. Right, right, right. And and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I I didn't mean to take away from your experience there at all, Brian. I not, had I been a little more alert, um, I would have asked you for your opinion. I, and I apologize to you. That's all right. I just thought I'd give it. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you did. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right, guys, uh, we're 25 minutes over. Um, I think what I'm going to have to start doing is figuring that we're going to get people coming in during the call and leave time at the end for the ones that I don't see at the beginning. So um, to try and get everybody in. And um, but thanks for those of you that were with us to the bitter end. And those that didn't can listen to the end of the conversation on the web, on the uh, on the recording. So next uh, time we're up um, is next Tuesday, the 26th. And uh, we'll be working on timing on that one. Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. You take night care. Up. Best. Good, Good night. night Thank you, Rick. Good night. Good night. Hey. <laughs>